Welcome to the show, Jara Fosterfell. Thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. I'm super excited to be here with you, my Gemini friend. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we're in person too. How we're in it? person. I feel like we're matching and we're in this really cool we got space the same right vibes. now. We're we... just slightly opposite. I got the plain pants. You got the plain shirt. Yeah. Fun, funky pants, fun shirt. We're just doing the thing. We're also, um, I'm noticing your high socks right now. Oh my God. Thank you so much for noticing <laughs> <laughs> because I am so obsessed with these socks. They are, you get two pairs from Amazon. They're 13 bucks, which like expensive for two pairs. So worth it. Yeah. Okay. And, and I'm uh, feeling really passionate about them lately so i'm actually genuinely excited that you but there's scrunch that. socks which i didn't know are those in because i i don't know if you noticed my little baby crew socks. yeah I those so i know the scrunch socks are in with gen z i'm not so sure i think like the little ankle socks are okay too like where they they come up you know halfway yeah i think so but it's just no show socks not in yeah totally that's the issue i've noticed that yeah and so had, they say i threw all of them away <laughs> <laughs> they went fully in the trash. I still have all mine, but <laughs> we won't talk about that. <laughs> Just kidding. I donated all of them because obviously I'm trying to be trendy now. You are actually the queen of trends. I mean, if we're going to be honest, like well, thank you. you are trendy, obviously in person, if you've seen any of her outfits, obviously the socks, <laughs> but you are the queen of trends online. And so I'd love to hear, tell everybody who is Jara and where did you come from? Where did I come from? Well, my mom was pregnant with me and she had a dream that said, name her Jara. So that's where that came from. Really? I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was supposed to be Haley. And then she had that dream and oh the dream gosh. said, name her Jara. So she did. Wait, I didn't know that. I know. It's, it's kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. Jara too, because it's such a like a, a cool name. Thank Very you. Very unique. Thank you. Yeah. It just came to her. She never heard it before. Yeah. And the dream happened. I so. can see you as a Haley too, though, because I last think, Halloween yeah. you were yeah, Haley, Haley Bieber. Yeah. yeah. Justin Bieber. Yeah. Amazing. Um, but in terms of how all of this started, I mean, I'll try to give you a little me in a nutshell. Feel yeah. free, if, you know, if you want me to expand on anything. Yeah. But I was a graphic designer fresh out of college and was in this really tough chapter of my life where I was at a job that was very manipulative. I had a bald patch on my head from hair that was falling out. I was so stressed. Mm -hmm. And I found an outlet through fitness as well as social media. And that is how social media began for me in 2015. And I was doing this workout program. I found community through that. That was really just special because I kind of didn't really have friends at the time. I was struggling with social anxiety. That was a whole thing. Mm -hmm. So I found friends. I found community. I found an outlet for or expressing myself. And then social media was kind of becoming social media. Like, you know, pre-2015, we're all taking high filtered photos of our coffee and like sunsets. Yeah. 2015, things start to change into starting to shift into the world of influencing content creation, that whole thing. And so I developed as that was developing first in the fitness world. And then I left the fitness world to pursue more lifestyle content creation. Then it was at the 20, end of 2019, I developed my social media coaching and education business, which, you know, brings us essentially to where we are now. A couple, couple details between 2019 yeah. and now. Um, but that is also when I started my TikTok account. And so TikTok is where I focus on TikTok, like my TikTok content is about TikTok or about social media in general. And that's where I focus the most on trends. I love to dissect trending themes, actual trends that people do. I give tutorials, I give breakdowns, I talk about the culture. Um, and then on Instagram, I focus more on social media strategy, authenticity, mindset, all that. Amazing. I love that. But who is Jara? Who is Jara? Yeah. Yeah. Um. <laughs> it's so funny. I feel like every, I ask this to everyone because I like to introduce, I like you to introduce yourself. Yeah. But a lot of times people are like, this is my business and this is how I am with my business. But like you are so much more than that and sure. like very multi-passionate. Yeah. Um, well, it's interesting you ask that because I've kind of been on a journey to figure that out a little bit more yeah. this year. I've been... I, it's been a struggle the last few years. I've just been in such a mode of burnout and working seven days a week and really not in a great place with my mental health. Like that's been a struggle. And I think I got to a place towards the end of last year where I, I was asking myself that. I'm like, who, like, who am I? Yeah. Um, my identity for so long has been so 
entangled and intertwined in my business because that's all that I have done. Like I have worked for seven days a week for years now, um, building my business and evolving and shifting and supporting my family. So to in, to, to detangle that has been challenging, but that's been something I've been working on um, this year. So is that is is my view of myself and who am I like complete? Have I gotten to the other side yet? Not not necessarily, but yeah. it's a it's a journey of, of discovery as I disentangle myself. I would say that I am a very goofy, wacky, silly type of a person. I think I am very determined, hardworking. Um, I love to honestly I think one of my favorite things in life is just like laughing and and making other people laugh so I think humor really is a core part of who I am yeah um I think there's a lot of like love there for for certain things like for instance I think of my passion for dogs like I have a huge passion for senior dogs and taking care of them and I've you know adopted a few of them um so yeah, there's a lot of like passion, love and silliness and wackiness and creativity as well. That's another word that comes to mind. Art has always been something that's come in and out of my life. I was a fine art major in college, more so focused on graphic design, but drawing, painting. I just took a painting class recently to sort of dip my toes back into that. So creative would be a big word that comes up as well. That's actually one of the first words that comes to mind when I think of you. I'm like, oh, yeah, she's like a creative first and foremost in all aspects, right? It's super yeah. cool to see that. If somebody were to be in your shoes maybe a year ago where they're like, I don't know who I am or I'm like, how do I find myself? How did you get to the point where you felt like you um, needed to figure that out or needed to like discover that? Oh, I think I hit like a pretty bad rock bottom. <laughs> so I wouldn't suggest waiting that long. Yeah. <laughs> But I think I got to a point and like I, I'm laughing in in like kind of a sad way. It's not funny. Um, I think I got to a point where it's like there was just no joy in anything. It makes me sad thinking about it. Um, like nothing felt fun. Nothing felt worth it. Like even the thought of seeing friends, it was like it, it felt like a huge lift like it was energy and it's not like oh I don't want friends and I like I yeah it's like I could almost see both worlds it was like of course I want to see my friends of course I want to hang out but like that doesn't feel fun and it feels hard to do yeah. so like once you get to that kind of point where nothing really feels fun or joyful um I think it was time to figure out how to change that. And I also just didn't see my life as sustainable. Yeah. Like I want to, you know, my husband and I are going to start IVF soon. Like we want to have a baby. And I'm like, how will I do this when I have a baby? Like just in terms, not just work, but just yeah. how I felt with life. Right. Personally, I decided to get help externally. I've worked with two and I'm still working with one um, kind of mindset, life, business. Well, one is mindset and kind of like business coachy and the other one's more like mindset and like life coaching. And those two people have been really pivotal in, in changing a lot for me. So I would say I, I needed that external help to kind of get out of that rock bottomy dark place. How do you find someone that can help you? I'm very fortunate that I had those connections already. Um, one, Nick, I've been connected to like since 2019. I was in a group coaching program, I think you are familiar, uh, where he was the mindset coach. So I've known of him. We've connected before. He came into my group program to coach. And he's also here in Austin. And I actually ran into him for the very first time at your Halloween party. <laughs> when she was ago. Haley Beaver. When I was Haley Full Beaver. Full circle here. <laughs> And Nick and I remember Nick and I sat down and had this like, here we are at this Halloween party. Yeah. Everyone's having fun. And like we were at your dining room like counter or something, just like locked into this conversation for an hour that was like really emotional and yeah. intense. And he just saw something in me. He was like, I actually was in a place that you were in, you know, a couple of years ago. And I just so want to help you. Yeah. He actually offered to like he just met up with me and did a session just as a friend, um, just to see how we would work together. And then I decided to move forward from there. And Lex was someone that I've also worked with before. So I think it's like, who who's in your network? And if, if you don't have someone in your network, 
Is there a friend who has gotten that type of help, whether it's a mindset coach, life coach, maybe it's a therapist, like there's so many ways to um, get help in an external source. So kind of seeking out who's in your circle, as well as who have your friends worked with that they could recommend as well. Yeah, I think that's such a a good thing to bring up because your circle is actually a lot bigger than you think. You just don't know who those people are. A prime example is one of our friends, common friend that you actually introduced me to is Meg Shackleton. She's connected me with so many different people because she just knows so many people. And like, if one person doesn't know, like someone's going to figure it out for you. And so your circle is big and there's always someone to help and support you. And I'm I'm just thankful that I've seen you through your journey, like get to this place where, you know, we're always a work in progress, right. but it seems like you're just like finding your light again and it's showing in a lot of ways. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's been a slow process. Like I want to say that for anyone who's listening, like it's not something that is instant. And I think there's an ebb and a flow. But when I look at where I am now compared to a year ago, I think I've made huge strides. So thank you for recognizing that. Of course. And so obviously like the help from other people and all this like mindset and deep inner work has been huge. But what about the creativity, the other outlets that you said that you had, but weren't able to like get back into those? Like, how did you know and where to go for that? Well, I know that I like to draw. I've painted a tiny bit here and there, but it's been more so drawing. And about, let's see, in 2021, I discovered in Austin, there is an art, it's not even art studio, like it's like a legit art school if you sign up for the the long-term classes, but it's called Atelier Dojo. Hopefully I'm saying that correctly. And I took two drawing classes in 2021, live, nude, Like you draw the same nude person for six weeks, like once a week, and each class is like three hours. And I'll never forget going to those classes was such a moment of like, I don't know, it's like a reset a little bit. Like I went there, I didn't look at my phone, there were no screens, no one knew me. Like it was just sort of this anonymous moment that was not connected to anything digital. Yeah. Plus, I got to draw, which I really like that too. Yeah. So I knew that place existed already. And so recently I went back on their website and they most, for the most part, had these like six week classes, but they actually offered one that was five days back to back, Monday through Friday, intro to oil painting. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is not the best time because the first two days are at the last two days of the launch of my course that I just launched. And if anyone's launched before, they know how intense that is and doing anything else during a launch is (laughs) not really ideal. But I was like, you know what? I feel like this is the ultimate, um, I don't know what the right word or phrase is, but it's like, I don't have to only be my business. Like, look at me. I have still two days of launching, but I'm going to go those last two days, three hours each day to an art class or four hours, I think. So um, that was really powerful for me. And, And same kind of feeling as those first drawing classes of shutting my brain off. Well, not shutting all my brain off because it was really hard. <laughs> I was like, it looked really like, hard. Turning off some of my brain, turning on some of my brain and just like relaxing into the process. And um, I think finding that outlet of creativity that's not connected to my work has just been it, it, that week was really amazing. It's something that I need to continue to do for sure. What about if you wanted to do something like that, but you were just like so nervous that you'd never done anything like that before? Would you do that? And how do you, what would you tell someone? It's not about the skill or the end result. It's more about just doing something Mm -hmm. new. It's like releasing the expectation that you have to be good. Like I walked into that class and I'm like, it literally does not matter Mm -hmm. what I create. It doesn't matter what level I'm at. Like I'm not here to create a masterpiece piece. I'm just here to try something new, to turn on a certain part of my brain and tap into some creativity. And that can all happen regardless of what it is that you create. And it's funny because the very first class when we'd get, I I didn't know how to mix the oil paints. Like I hadn't draw, like you have to have a background in drawing to be able to oil paint. And like I hadn't really drawn in a really long time. Um, So I remember like just holding my brush in front of the canvas. I'm like, shit. And like, I got nervous and like my heart's kind of racing for just because like to be a beginner is challenging. Mm-hmm. Um, so I felt that in the moment. But I think you, if you can overcome the fact that you're not there to create anything specific, but it's more the act of doing, you can allow yourself to em- embrace being a beginner and just sort of like 
melt into the process. I yeah, think. yeah, I love that. I love the way you looked at that too. Was there any point during the week during this new class where you felt like someone was further along than you or oh, you were comparing? Totally, totally. But not in a bad way. Um, there were five or six of us and there were there was definitely one guy who I think was more like maybe the most beginner out of the whole class. And then there were two people who were like legit painters. Like mm-hmm. they were really freaking good, totally different styles. And then there was like me and one or two other people kind of in the middle. And what I loved was halfway through the the class, we did a critique and then we also did it at the end. And the critique, it wasn't a critique. It was just, let's look at everyone's. And mostly everyone was really nice and complimentary. <laughs> it was actually very sweet. And it was just so cool to see the different styles, the different progression. And my favorite thing was the last day we had all five paintings and we put them all in rows so we could see all of ours, but also everyone else's. And it was actually so beautiful to see the progression of our own because actually by the last day, my painting, I was like, whoa, that's good. (laughs) (laughs) I was like really impressed with myself, which once again, doesn't matter, but still it's cool to feel that. Yeah. And then to see the progression of everyone else's, I remember this one guy named Gary, I think, oh no, Barry, by the, the last class, like I was just amazed by what he created compared to the first day. And I felt like so proud of him. Aww. I'm like, here's a stranger. Yeah. So it wasn't ever really actually comparison in a in a bad way. It was more of just um, in awe of everyone's different styles and own progression throughout that. Yeah, that was my next question. Like, could you see that everyone was painting the same person, right? Yes. Could you yeah. see the difference in how people took that person and put it on their paper and how? Oh, totally. Yeah. Like this one guy, Michael, he had a really thick style. Like his paint strokes were so thick. And I, I if at any one style I was like wanting to be like one day, I'm like, I really like that. I love, love the texture of the paint. Yeah. Another gal, not quite as thick, but probably the most realistic out of everyone. Someone else almost had like a more ge- geometric approach like it wasn't realistic yeah. but very like geometric almost shapes in a way uh the guy who's more beginner had a much more flat approach but it was actually amazing even though he was more beginner to see like it, i was still so impressed by what he was creating because you just saw how he was seeing things like through his lens like this is what he was creating and it was still his own style like you could yeah. see the style across the painting so it didn't matter what level people were at everyone's own vision and sort of interpretation of the person and then how that translated to the texture and the strokes and the lighting and all that came through which is really cool to see i think it's really cool to have this transition into what you call the secret sauce. Mm. You give people the opportunity to show up for themselves on social media specifically because there is no one like you, right? And you are showing up in a way that feels most authentic to you. So as a content creator, social media speaker, and extraordinaire that you are, what exactly is a secret sauce when it comes to like authenticity? So secret sauce is essentially authenticity. Authenticity is secret sauce. Cool, love it. So it is your humanness. It is your realness. It is your rawness. It's the past. It's the present. It's your energy. It's your personality. It is you in all forms, then, now, here, there, etc. cetera. Um, what I have gone ahead and, and created is kind of like a formula or a framework for secret sauce. Now, I normally apply it to social media. I think it can also just be seen in the context of life as well. Because what I've found over the years teaching social media specifically is that people really struggle with authenticity. The advice that you hear is be authentic, show up authentically. And then it's like, cool, I'm going to do that. Wait a second. How do I do that? (laughs) Because it can be really challenging to take the real life you and translate that to a digital version. Like there's no rule book. There's no guidelines for that. Not that I think there should be a rule book, but I think there needs to be some sort of a like push in the right direction down the authenticity path. So the framework I've created, I call it the four quadrants of secret sauce. And it just allows you to take this concept and make it more tangible, but also then actionable. And those four quadrants are foundational, 
present, professional, and lighthearted. So Foundational Secret Sauce focuses more on the past. It's all of the stories, challenges, experiences, moments that have brought you to where you are today. So it usually focuses on the bigger things, the more pivotal things, but it can be small things in your past that you remember that have somehow pushed you in the direction of of who you are and where you are today. Can you give us an example? Sure. So for me, I would think of my pivots. Yeah. So I was a graphic designer after college. I then pivoted into the world of social media as well as fitness. I was a soul cycle instructor. Then I left that. I was a lifestyle influencer. And then what I do now. And then if if I pick that apart, there's other moments chapters of foundational secret sauce. For example, I think of my public speaking journey. I used to have a total fear of public speaking, and now it's something that I do part of my job. So um, that's foundational. Um, It doesn't have to be professional, like getting married. That's a huge part of someone's life if they get married. So that's foundational. Um, I would say Spicy Grandpa, who was my first ever dog, my soul dog, um, who was with me for, you know, 10 years of my life and was at my wedding and through thick and thin and we lived in 13 different apartments in four different states like he's part of my foundational secret sauce so personal professional it's the things chapters people etc that have brought you to this present moment um Then we have present secret sauce, and that's as it sounds. That's you in the present moment. And that can be such a range of things. Once again, it could be, um, well, well, we'll save the professional, but it could be the good things that are in the moment. It could be the challenging things, like everything I just told you when we started off the podcast, talking about the things I was dealing with last year. Like in the moment, that was my present secret sauce. Like that was something challenging I was going through. Um, It could also be the really good things, the the hobbies, the things you're doing on the weekend, like me going to a painting class, that was present day secret sauce. Um, me going on a trip and going to the farmer's market, like that's present day secret sauce. But it's also your current energy and personality. That's a little bit more challenging to, to like quantify because energy and personality isn't something you can just sort of like say farmer's market or trip or like, you know, painting class. So that's a little bit more intangible, but it is your personality and energy in the moment. Okay. Then we have professional secret sauce. Professional secret sauce is your uniqueness as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, as whatever you are doing in your professional space. It is your perspectives, your unique point of view, your frameworks, for example, uh, four quadrants of secret sauce, like that's part of my professional secret sauce, which like is a little (coughs) meta, I guess. Um, It's why someone would come to you over someone else. It's how you see things differently in your field. It's a little bit more in the way that you think, your philosophy, your values, your approach versus something you're doing. So mm-hmm. okay. that can be something a little bit challenging for people to um, to grasp because that is also a little bit less tangible than yeah. some of the other things. But yeah, it's more it's more your your views and like I, I, if you are an expert in your field, you have come to a point where you have developed your own things in the way that that you go about and and see things. So that's your your professional secret sauce. Could that be if you were someone that didn't have your own business or you worked for someone else? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. What would that look like? Um, For instance, uh, if you are, of course, I think graphic designers, I'll just go with that to begin with. But like if you're a graphic designer at a marketing agency or firm, you might have a specific viewpoint of how you create a logo. Um, You might have really strong opinions about like certain fonts and like your opinion about a certain font and how to use that is very different from another graphic designer or um, how you would approach going about branding something specific. So just off the top of my head, a lawyer could be at a firm and like they also have their own professional secret sauce, even if they are not self-employed and they're part of a company or part of a firm. Cool. Love that. And then lastly, we have lighthearted secret sauce, okay. my personal favorite or that one is, of my yeah. favorites. <laughs> and it's as it sounds. It's, it's lighthearted. It's silly, wacky, goofy. It can also just be more like part of like your everyday and mundane. So it doesn't have to be ha-ha, funny, wacky. It could just be something small and something that you might even think is insignificant, but 
it's just part of the secret sauce. So let, let me give you a couple examples. My lighthearted secret sauce, the funny stuff is like armpit farts. Armpit farts. <laughs> I was like, it's definitely going to be on that list. Armpit farting. Um, things like sometimes even just sharing silly stuff that comes through. For example, um, someone left a comment that they thought was being really mean and I thought it was actually amazing. I was like, thank you so much. They're like, you look like Steven Tyler. Like as if that was a mean thing. And I'm like, Steven Tyler's really cool. Like, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> but that turned into a whole thing. Like yeah. I shared that and pe- my community started photoshopping my head on top of his body and I was <laughs> posting that. So of course that's very lighthearted. Um, but something that might not seem that funny can also be part of it. And The example I'm about to give actually became something funny, but unintentionally. Cheese and crackers. I really love cheese and crackers, but cheese and crackers inherently, like in in and of themselves, are it's not funny. It's like just a snack. Like it's not that funny. (laughs) 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 It's fucking hilarious. It's cheese and crackers. We're laughing right now. (laughs) Cheese and crackers. Depends on the cheese and the crackers. (laughs) But I just started sharing it on my stories and like for some reason people really attached to it and they're like, I love cheese and crackers. And they started tagging me in cheese memes and sending me funny cheese sayings. Like, And so that was something I shared where I think the average person would go, this isn't interesting enough to share. Mm. This is random. This has nothing to do with my business. So what's the point? Yeah. And the point is that I would say some of the strongest connections are built from those things that seem insignificant Mm. or seem every day and routine because those are the things that other people can see themselves in. And the beauty of that in general is connection, but also the beauty of that is it's a connection that then could lead to something later. I'll never forget um, I was learning how to shuffle, which that was like a small three-month period, but it was great. It's a type of dance if anyone is not familiar with that. And there was a gal who signed up for my group coaching program because I shared my shuffling. And she said, seeing you be a beginner at something and sharing that so openly allowed me to feel really comfortable being a beginner in your space, in Mm. your world. And so normally, you know, sometimes people are like, oh, all business, like share, sell, 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 and click here, whatever. That's all great. We need to sell. I love me some selling. (laughs) Got to promote. But there's a whole other world that opens up when you share your life, the routine, the mundane, the cheese and crackers, all that kind of stuff. It creates connection, conversation, relatability, and then that could really lead to something else later down the line. Would you say that authenticity and like relatability are very similar? Interesting. I've never actually answered that question before, so I'm going to think through it as I I talk through it. But I Mm -hmm. think in order to be relatable, you have to be authentic. I think that's the Mm. connection. Okay. I don't think you can be relatable without authenticity, but I think you can be authentic and not be relatable. Like for instance, think of, you know, I don't know. I don't know why I'm thinking of the Kardashians, but they could be like, (laughs) here's my fancy bag that I just bought and I'm on a trip. Like, okay, they're they're doing that. I guess they're authentically sharing what they're doing in the present moment, but that's not really relatable necessarily if I'm watching that. I'm like, okay, I'm not buying that fancy bag. I'm not on a trip. So I'm just trying to trying to think that through. Um, Or what about someone that thinks they're being relatable, but it's mm -hmm. actually just they're trying to be someone they're not? Then I guess that would be a false sense of relatability because someone could create a persona they yeah. or maybe it's not even as far as a persona but it's someone just kind of putting on an act and it's part them part you know who they think that they should be and i guess in that act they could come off as relatable but then it's not truly relatable because that's not actually them. I think in order to be relatable, it has to be a true part of yourself. Otherwise, it's just a front. And I guess you could be relatable via a front, but then it's just not true relatability. How can you tell who those people are online? You know, I think it comes down to just like a feeling. Okay. And I don't know if that feeling is always correct. Because there could be people who just put up a front and it seems really real and you feel like you're connected to them. You feel like you're relating to them and they're just doing a really good job of that. Um, so it's it's kind of hard to decipher. But I think a lot of us are intuitive and get a gut feeling and we connect to the people who 
we want to connect to in terms of there's a beneficial relationship there, as in they inspire us or they make us think in a different way or they ignite something in us. And I think most of the time we have like a little bit of a spidey sense in yeah. terms of what's real, what's not, and what's beneficial for us in terms of that connection. Have you ever like related to someone or like really loved their stuff online and then met them in person and was like, who is this? Ooh. Oh, I, that hasn't happened in a while. I think the most I can think of, it, it's never been that severe. It's maybe been more of they come across more bubbly, kind of vivacious, friendly, and then they feel a little bit more reserved. Mm, okay. So I can think of that, but not to a point where it's felt like totally fake. They're completely different in person. But but to a degree, I, I get that because I think it's for some people, I can see it could be easier to be very energetic to a camera where yeah. it's just the camera versus yeah. in person. Like I used to struggle with social anxiety. I, I know what can happen in a social setting. So I can also understand that maybe it's not fakeness, yeah. but it's just a different environment. And we all show up differently in different environments, especially if we're struggling with something socially. Yeah. I think that's a really great like lead into your social anxiety and how now you're on stages in front of hundreds of people. How did you get to that point, like being able to show up like that in front of that many people? It was a long journey. So it was not something that happened overnight. Yeah. But I see different moments of my foundational secret sauce, now that we know that term, that have contributed to that. So I think it all I'm going to say it actually started more in my influencer days because there were times where I would have to oh, – I remember – this is a good one. Uh, I was an Adidas ambassador for three years, which was like the most incredible experience. And they asked me and my friend Shanae to go to a Dick's Sporting Goods headquarters and speak to their employees about kind of influencers and working with brands. This is like early days, like 2016. And – being thrown into those situations with Adidas, there were workouts that I had to lead and like introduce a big event. Those were terrifying for me. It was like awful. Um, I was shaking. I, I would I would dread it just because I just knew how terrified I would be. But the more I was thrown into those situations, I, I don't want to say I got used to it, but it just gets a tiny bit easier each time. And then I think a huge pivotal part was Soul Cycle. Because at Soul Cycle, I had to speak, not that my classes were consistently sold out, but it means sometimes I was speaking to an almost empty room. But every single day, regardless, I did have to speak in front of a room ranging from, you know, maybe five people were there or maybe 65 people were there. Every single day for six months, when I turned the music down and like turned my mic up and like turned the lights down so people couldn't see my hands shaking. I was terrified every single day. My heart would race. My hands were shaking. My voice, I think I was, I spoke really quickly like, hey everyone, like welcome to Soul Cycle. Like, we're just <laughs> Because <laughs> I spoke really fast when I was nervous. Yeah. And that was like throwing myself into the yeah. into the ring every single day. So that was really pivotal as well. So all of these little stepping stones. And then I remember getting asked to speak or, or lead a three-hour workshop for like 10 people for social media in 2019. So all of these things just contributed to, to the point where um, I am today. And it, it's been those stepping stones, whether it's been in person, whether it's been vir like even just the virtual stages, like speaking to my group coaching programs um, on a Zoom call, like that was terrifying for yeah. me at the time. So all of these are um, moments where I've been able to develop my skills, work on my nervousness and, and just grow every single time, whether it's in person, virtual, um, big or small. You know, it's so interesting because like so many of these things that you're talking about can be related to so many aspects, especially in fitness and wellness, right? We're not just going to go into the gym and lift 300 pounds. We're going to go slowly to get there, right? Right. But the social anxiety aspect, I feel like, is is huge right now, especially after COVID, right? Where we've been inside of our homes a lot of the time. It's easier. We can do everything from home. We yeah. work from home. We're home a lot. So after, you know, the world opened back up for COVID, did you feel like you kind of went backwards a little bit with that? Or how did that feel? I don't think I went backwards. I don't think so. I mean, to be honest, 
COVID, I don't feel like my life changed that much mm-hmm. because I was already working from home prior yeah. to that. Most of my work was on the computer. Like I had my group coaching program in progress before COVID hit. So I didn't, life didn't change for me that drastically in terms of my day to day. And so therefore, I don't think it had that big of an impact on me socially, I think, which okay. I know for some people it was really not the case. So I feel yeah. fortunate for that. What would you tell someone that wanted to go to a social kind of setting, not even speaking, just going to a networking event or something, Mm. and they were just, like, so shaky and so nervous? Like, can you remember the time that you were, like, in a car before you went somewhere? Oh, yeah. Yeah. The worst was when I was a graphic designer in Boston pre-starting Instagram, and this was at the job that was really manipulative and awful. Right. I was working, once again, another seven days a week of work for once you added up all my hours, I was making like way less than minimum wage. And the thing that I hated about it, amongst other things, was the social component because there were so many – it was like this little startup and there were so many events that they were throwing to try and promote the brand. So I'd have to stay late and like mingle with these people that I didn't know. Yeah. And it kind of felt like uh, it just kept getting worse every time because what would happen was I would – speak to someone and I'd get really, really hot and I would start to sweat. And like I was talking to someone. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm starting to sweat. They're noticing that I'm sweating. This is so embarrassing. Let me awkwardly say, oh, got to run to the bathroom. Like, yeah. oh, what did I just like get the shits like mid conversation yeah. or something? <laughs> <laughs> Too many cheese and crackers. Too many cheese and crackers. Um, and run to the bathroom and like put water on my wrist to try and cool down. And then like I'd cool down a little bit and I'd go back and it yeah. would happen again. It was yeah. just awful. Um So at that time, I actually went to a therapist who specialized in social anxiety and uh, did specifically CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. So I think for some people, like how much is it inhibiting your life? Like how is it at the point where you are physically not going places and avoiding things because like social anxiety is a real thing. I'll never forget getting on the intro phone call with this therapist and he would just validated everything that I said because it at the time, like I didn't even know if that was like a real thing. And it is. It's a very, very real thing. Right. And so I think it's are you at the point where you need professional help and like please go seek that because it's life changing. Um, if not, it's are are you able to find comfort like going with a friend? Like can you have a little bit of a crutch going with someone that can balance that energy? Um, can you go, I'm gonna go for, you know, 15 minutes and I'm gonna talk to one person and yeah. I'm gonna leave. Like, are there little goals you can set for yourself rather than feeling like you need to be there for hours and talking to a million people? Maybe it's just talk to one person and then like you're out of there yeah. and the next time maybe it's two. Yeah. So I think there's little goals and ben- benchmarks you can make for yourself. I love that. Yeah. It's just like very baby steps, right? With yeah. anything else, like we don't go from here here overnight. It's, it's, right. it's a while to do anything. And I think everyone struggles with it to a degree. Like not every, like I think, you know, I think of my dad, like he never struggled with any, he's like the complete opposite. But I think most of us struggle with the social element and like realizing that everyone kind of stand, like feels in the same boat. And I think just always, if you can just ask people about themselves, people like talking about themselves and and just at least having a few questions in your back pocket that you can go to, that can also ease the process, just having that ready to go and knowing that other people are probably feeling the same as you. Also, uh, I love a compliment. Yes. Love that shirt. Where'd you get that necklace? That at least starts the conversation. Yeah. yeah. And I think people are really thankful when someone else starts the conversation. Yeah. Too. Because we're like, if I think of a networking event, you know, obviously it can feel awkward. Like, OK, just walk up to someone and say, I like your pants. Or yeah. where are you coming from? Or like, what were you planning on? Who do you want to meet? I don't know. I yeah. hadn't been in a networking event in I forever. Know. But like, just thinking of someone coming up to me and saying that, I would feel so thankful. Yeah, and so taking that initiative, I think, is a really beautiful thing as well. So how can you do that on social media? Chatting with other people, connecting with other yeah, people, or con- like showing up? Connecting with other people, showing up in a way that you may not have been before. Maybe you want to dabble in it, but I'm mm. just not sure. 
I think it first depends on like the goal. What are you using social media for? Are you using it to support your business? Are you excelling something specific? Are you just building your personal brand? Are you a content creator? I think understanding what you are using social media for first is is really important. Um, And then from there, you can like develop, you know, what's the next step? What's the strategy? But I think one important thing is that you don't have to bear it all. You don't have to share everything in order to make connections, in order to create content, in order to be successful on social media. And I think that's a really important part going in that a lot of people will hear and just go, oh, like just a little bit of that load off. Yeah. Um, Because you can think of it like a dial. It's not an on or off switch Mm -hmm. where I'm either like showing up well or I'm showing up badly or I'm showing up authentically or I'm show or I'm I'm not showing up authentically at all. Yeah. If you think about it as a dial and go, okay, well, I could turn it all the way up to a 10 or maybe it's up to a 1 in terms of my personality and and yeah. how I'm showing up and what it is that I'm sharing and maybe you start it at a 1 or a 2 yeah. and then find your comfort there and if you feel like it's needed to turn it up more you can. I think that metaphor is just a good place to start with showing up and sharing yourself. I love that you brought that up too because a lot of what we talked about with being relatable or authentic or having your secret sauce is like you don't have to show every secret sauce. I don't have to tell you about my mom, dad, what happened when I was 4. Like yes, but you can share little bits and pieces of it that you feel comfortable with too, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah. I I actually, for, I'm glad you brought that up because I forgot to mention that with the four quadrants Yeah. in that you don't have to share all four quadrants in order to show up authentically. You could, once again, think of it as a dial where you are showing up fully in professional and maybe in foundational as well, Yeah. Um, or mostly, not maybe full dial, but present secret sauce might not feel aligned for you. Like right. a lawyer, maybe a lawyer is not sharing their deepest, darkest secrets and their mom and their dad and their right. baby and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But professional secret sauce, like hell yeah, that makes a lot right. of sense for a lawyer or someone who has to be a little bit more buttoned up. Um, so I'm glad you brought that up because yes, you do not have to share every single detail. And when it comes to the quadrants, you have autonomy over or which ones you choose and how much you choose within each one. Have you ever had someone say to you, oh, my God, I feel like I know you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. How does it feel for you? I take it as a compliment. Yeah. Yeah. I take it as a compliment, but then I'm like, but you see what I want to show you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So they they feel like they know me and they're like, you know, we're like we're buddies or they think we're right. friends or whatever because they see that. But there's so much more to me sometimes that I'm like. True. But you don't really know me. But that's. Mm because I decided to do that, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's a good point because if I think about the reverse of someone saying like, gosh, I can think of so many things over the year. And and I've gotten messages where people are like, you're not authentic. (laughs) It's like, okay, which one is it? (laughs) Always somebody. And so I think of of that scenario where I'm like, well, yeah, you don't know all of me. I'm not sharing all of me. So like, how dare you make that assumption of whatever it may be? So it is actually interesting to think about it in the reverse right? because it's like, yeah, I'm not sharing every single detail of my life. So you don't know me. But if you think about it in what you described, of, uh, I, I feel like I know you, but it's like, wait a second, you actually don't. Yeah. So it's interesting to sort of juxtapose those two a little bit. Yeah. Hmm. Social media is such a, it's such a weird world because, and maybe you can agree with this as well, because I love it so much sometimes. And sometimes I'm just like, God, I want nothing to do with this. Totally. How do you kind of manage that, the the burnout sensation of social and just feeling that way, like icky when you get on it? Yeah. Oh, it's tough. I mean, sometimes you just need to take a break. Yeah. I think there's so much pressure, like, show up all the time consistently. And I don't think that consistency means burning yourself out with social media. I don't think it means showing up 365 days a year. I think you can just take a break when you need to and and reset. And that's just a powerful thing to just, even if it's like, I'm taking the weekend off, or maybe it's a full week or two weeks, or maybe it's just evenings, like figuring out what your 
reset is, is important. I also think over the years, I have changed the way in which I have shared myself. I think influencer, content creator, so we're talking 2015 to like 2019, that was like the full on influencer Jerry years. I shared a lot more yeah. of my life and now I share less. Yeah. And I think that's been helpful as well, just to not feel like I'm bearing my soul all the time. And maybe that changes how people think about me. I mean, I, I remember getting a message. Someone's like, I wish you used to, you know, share your life like you used to and not share your business. I'm like, okay, well, <laughs> God make money. <laughs> the cheese but- and crackers aren't going to buy themselves, you know? <laughs> But that was like a shift from content creator, influencer Jara into social media coach, educator uh, Jara, who I am today. And I think with that shift as well, like the shift of my role of what I do, that has also lent itself to wanting to share less of my personal life. And yeah. I think, um, you know, I still share a lot. There's still, you know, personal things that I will open up about. Um, it's just less consistent as it used to be. And I think that helps that overall feeling yeah. of overwhelm with social media as well to create boundaries and have certain things that are private or take some time off, whatever it may be. What if you're someone that doesn't really post on social media? And I like to call like Teddy or Aaron the lurkers. Well, Aaron doesn't really lurk. Teddy is he someone- little, I think he does a little yeah, bit. Yeah. <laughs> Teddy is someone that will watch everybody's stories and won't post for five years. Yeah. What do you tell someone like that that like knows they need to like take a break from it or get away from it because it's like mental health, but they like just can't or oh, it's like hard they to need, do? They're lurking and they need a break. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they need a break from the comparison or like the break. constant, yeah. you know? <laughs> I think in that sense, it's like just delete the app off yeah. your phone. Like I've done that before. It's been a long time, but I've done that before. And I find that there's just this weird muscle yeah. memory where you just open up your phone and you just click on the thing because it's right there. <laughs> I, I even had a period where this is years ago. I would even just move the it. app to the yeah. very last page okay. of your phone um, because that helped you just not instantly click. Yeah. So I think it's either, yeah, moving it and and or just taking it off and or setting, you know, there's apps that limit your time, like that kind of thing as well. Um, sort of taking a hard stance and just saying, I'm going to take a little bit of a break from this. I love that. Yeah. I've actually put on like little time limits and then I'm like, oh, another one minute, <laughs> another 15 minutes. I've never used the time limit really? before. I'm just like, eh. Because you know what's hard too? Like with what I do, yeah. there's such a crossover between just consuming content content because For I sure. want to scroll and consume content as well as like work and research right. because on TikTok I'm like what are the latest trends that I could do tutorials on right. what are thing what are people asking about because I'm creating I create content about social media yeah. and then same thing with with Instagram it's like well at staying up to date with what people are doing what are yeah. the trending audios which I don't focus on a ton but sometimes for clients I need to kind of take a look and right. and, and send them that stuff so yeah. it's hard when there isn't a clear line because there's just for fun scrolling and then there's the work scrolling yeah. as well. So that's something I definitely struggle with a bit. So yeah, no time limits for you because you exactly. just be pressing that 15 more minutes. Yeah, I'm like, I'm working. <laughs> Don't you know? <laughs> um, okay, what, this is something I ask everybody and we usually go into the fitness world, but let's ask you, what is one thing that you wish you knew before you started public speaking? Oh, it's funny because I feel like we could go more mindset. I feel like we could go more technical. Like technical, it's like speak slower mm, than okay. you think that you need to. Yeah. Like big time. Like like I said, with Soul Cycle, I would speak really fast. Like yeah. We have a tendency when we're nervous, like we just kind of get through and we don't really take a breath. And then you're out of breath and you're yeah, like, ah, so fast. <laughs> um, and I think even speaking at a normal speed when public speaking, just like conversational with a friend, I think that sometimes is too fast as well. Okay. And I think the slower, not, I don't want to say super slow, but the slower you speak, speak and it's going to feel slower that like in your mind you're like oh my god am I speaking this slow like what yeah. the hell but it allows you to take more pauses it allows you to just like think a little bit your your brain is ahead of your speech versus your speech being ahead right. of your brain that's when people start to ramble and go off you know go off sides of things so technically speaking I think of that um mm, in <sighs> I think another thing that comes to mind is that and it's still true to this day, and it's a lesson I'm constantly learning, is that I'm so nervous. I'm still so nervous before I get on stage. But then once I'm on stage, I'm fine. Yeah. 
So that's interesting as well to really manage the nerves and the feeling is like the the quote unquote worst part is like the hour or the couple hours before. Yeah. But then once I'm on stage, as long as I'm prepared, which I am. Always. She's <laughs> always. always prepared. <laughs> Over prepared. Um, it's smooth sailing. So yeah. like trying to tap into that energy a little bit more to minimize the nerves before as well. Cool. I love that. Well, where can people find you and connect with you online? You can find me on social media. Uh, yep. The Jerabine. social media. <laughs> and I got a little dot in there. The freaking Jerabine with no dot is like an account from 2012. Mm. I'm like, can you just give me that, please? Yeah, but Jerabine on Instagram, on TikTok, Jerabine, all one word, dot com uh, for my website if you want to check me out. Well, thank you so much for being here. For I so me. appreciated our conversation and we talked about all things. So yeah. thank you so much. Thank you.